Hello everyone, I'm doing a series on South African chess players and I'm starting with Daniel Cordry. He is probably one of our strongest yet. So watch the game and maybe we could appreciate his strength. Okay, so he's playing against the Grandmaster from Austria, Shingilia, and his name is David. So we've got a David versus Daniel game. We've got the first few moves, d4, knight f6, c4, g6. And then f3, going into this very specific anti Grunfeld other kind of variation. And d5, obviously you need to be careful of e4 coming, so d5. And c takes d, knight takes, and d4. And we get into what they call the Goglitze attack. And this is something Carlson and Caruana have been playing for a while, and which we are seeing. It has been played in 2014, and this game is 2016, so a lot of research has been done in this line. So it's a pretty, it's a pretty sharp line with a lot of possibilities and nuances for deviating and throwing your opponent off a bit. Okay, knight c3, bishop g7, bishop e3, all mainline castles, queen d2, setting up queen side castles and the move bishop h6 and... Running up with these pawns, typical of this structure when there's an f3. Okay. So, knight c6, main line, castles queen side, as we expected, and queen d6. And it's in this moment that um, Shingilia plays a bit of... Uh, he plays main line, but it's, it's not the move preferred by Carlsen who's played this position quite a few times, so you really need to ask yourself what's up with it, and that's king b1. Now, usually Carlsen would go knight b5 in this situation, and then you see we, we're hitting the queen and the pawn on c7. So the queen needs to go back to d7, but then it kind of fizzles out as well, so um, it's not that much advantage um, after going king b1 now, and then but a few more moves, and we've got lots of trades and a bit of a drawish position. And after something like um, king, king b1, rook d8, d5, a6, doing something different like uh, going back knight c3, we get this cute move, queen e8, and... Now we're looking at a game with structure, um, which is fine for both sides, but maybe even black could be like preferred here with some targets in the center. And this has actually been positions that Levon and Fabi Carlson and Nakamura. This is a very um, high league position, so it's it's been sorted out there. I think the the theory isn't isn't that much, but so now. Now, we always see the inclusion of d5 in these positions. I think, like we just did with in this line, we've got d5. But now, in this specific game, I think the move d5 wasn't wasn't prepped correctly. So we, we got king b1 before this knight b5 stuff. So quite rightly, Daniel goes a6 to prevent b, knight b5, and then d5 came immediately. So... I was just wondering about keeping stuff simple for now in the center and going h4. Because you do control some black squares and then after black contends for e5 himself, you could decide to shut down. But now you're kind of opening this, the eyes of this bishop by going d5 immediately. Knight goes to a7. Knight a5 might be a bit stronger because of heading into c4. But it is worth mentioning that the move... D5 is a completely new move that David has played, and it could be that he's trying to throw Daniel out of his prep. So I think when, you, when you're playing something a bit more sharp, like knight a5 in this situation, you might feel like you're walking into your opponent's prep, which you probably are, and after something like queen c1, there might not be that much for you. This would have been stronger for Daniel, but... Um, knowing that this person might have gone through the positional ideas 
and something like this and tested out some of them it's not that nice so maybe maybe you went knight a7 deliberately you obviously had the clear plan of going knight b5 now but whether or not david had prepped this i'm not too sure because his next move is still accurate h4 launching a, an attack on the king's side but then after knight b5 he doesn't capture this knight completely correctly the correct way would have been to go bishop takes and then knight takes um, the pawn so that you kind of force something with this queen and there's only one really good solution and that's knight c4 counter attacking and it seems like the only way this position really gets played is after some captures and it, it, it will walk into an end game that's fairly equal for both sides i presume so maybe a bit of an edge for white but so Chinkita doesn't take with the bishop he, he does a bit of a inaccuracy goes with the knight first and then this kind of just allows the rook to see a2 to see the light and then he also he's a bit greedy at this moment and he goes bishop takes b5 after all of this so i'm not too sure what his plans were it could have been just psychologically keeping up with material and thinking that calculating that there aren't really immediate threats on a7 or on this diagonal but just something felt a bit off and it felt to me that h5 the insertion there would have, would have been a bit stronger now in this position you're black maybe just pause for a second after thinking of your move okay i don't know if you paused but the key thing you want to try and do here is black is get rid of this bishop so that you can start attacking here the queen side with your strong beautiful bishop and this bishop currently is supported by this one covering this square on c4 so how do you do that daniel cordry goes bishop d7 knocking that bishop away and quite willingly uh, david just takes it now i i would have i would have probably wondered about the move queen e2 which does seem um does seem a bit better just holding on to stuff but Actually, you're just overpowered after something like rook a5, and then after the trades, you're actually just launching in quite quickly with the doubled rooks here. So holding on to it also doesn't work. So okay, he he concedes he concedes um, Daniel the plan by going bishop takes. Now, yeah, okay. So after bishop takes, Daniel goes for knight c4, which is quite strong. And this is quite illuminating to myself, because usually you, you have a plan, but just swapping some move orders around um, can make your plan work. And in this case, your plan was to fork. And now if you're going to first take the bishop, you're not going to get the opportunity to fork these two pieces. So he does that first, and after queen moves, he makes a mistake, because his attack is actually just rolling on beautifully now. So... Um, I'm going to go on with the game without showing why it is a mistake, and um, then we'll get back to this position later. Because mainly I want to show you the concrete idea that Daniel had in his mind through following up with this next move. And then you could maybe appreciate his strength, <laughs> and maybe just that there was one moment he kind of maybe missed. Um, it is a mistake though the following move, but it doesn't completely throw the game away, which is nice. He goes queen a6, just attacking that pawn on a2. Quite clearly that's the plan. And deserting this bishop on d7. No regards to that bishop. Bishop d4 is played, and this is not the best defense. Um, the best defense... We'll, come, we'll get to that bit later. Let's, let's just look at bishop d4. So bishop d4 is played. Queen takes a7 check, obvious. And then this move is really a pauser. So I'll give you two seconds to pause again. Okay. So the next move is pretty crazy. And I didn't see it myself the first time I went over. And then after seeing it, I actually started appreciating Daniel's style of playing. Because he didn't just beat this GM, he really chopped him. Went rook, a3. Just beautiful, because this pawn is currently pinned. Now, 
I was also just thinking, what what does Rook A3 even do? And then after just thinking about let's just looking at a stupid move, I, I realized that the threat is to go to b3 and then to simply mate the long diagonal. But okay, I I, I chose a mate in five because this is quite cool. But basically, this pin helps you a few times and then you get to mate the king in the corner. But that's the power of this, this rook on a3. It's not just the a rook battery. It opens up the b3 square for your queen. So just ignoring it with something like 92 is just going to get you chopped really quickly. Okay, rook a3. Um, let's say Daniel decided to switch move orders and go bishop takes d4 first. Now suddenly his attack doesn't work again. Because um, you kind of need this bishop to be stationary on g7 in some of the lines you'll see in a second. But for instance now, if we go bishop takes... Uh, d4 first, it doesn't really do a lot. After rook takes and going a3 now, you can maybe just walk into rook takes d3 and your attack isn't as strong anymore. The b3 square isn't available. You are probably still winning, but um, your compensation is going to have to show it because of that extra bishop. So you're really going to have to make sure. Okay, so he didn't do it like this though. He kept that piece there because the mate works whether this this bishop is taken or not. So that's quite cool. So there's an immediate threat and um, bishop a4 stops it. It covers that b3, b3 square. And now the beautiful knight e3 check just also really got to me. I need to look at this position for a while. But it takes away the d4 bishop or the queen. And okay, let's just see, let's just see it quickly because it also opens up the c4 square for the queen. But the actual square it opens up, I, I didn't realize initially. It's c3 after this bishop takes, because of this bishop. And we see that immediately, rook c3 check, and this queen is chopped. Let's just quickly come back here. So which in which other ways can this piece be taken? By well, the queen, OK? You just want to lose your queen. It's just so beautiful. The, that queen is getting lost. And for instance, running with the king just doesn't really seem to do anything because this pawn is still pinned, this bishop's still hanging, this rook is hanging. Just pick your way to, to play this position. Knight e3, really a beautiful move, and it this is such a forceful move. Um you could also have just gone rook takes a a4. There's nothing wrong with that. The attack doesn't fizzle out after this. Um, but now, now this kind of I think it's just a spectacular move. And bishop takes e3 was played, and then rook c3 check using that bishop, and the queen was chopped. And now the conversion after this was was pretty sweet as well. And um, I think I appreciated I appreciated the way he didn't just blunder this away because. Even if you're playing against a GM, I mean, he's got a rook and a bishop for a, a rook and a knight for your queen, which could sometimes be quite tricky compensation. But the way he played it was just strong. Um, queen takes a4. The knight comes in. And the rook comes in. It doesn't trade immediately. And then after this, he trades. Okay, I was just wanting to see. You can you can take the knight, but then the bishop gets defended. But this this would have also been good. It was just I think maybe he was just choosing how to play. Uh, white was lost here, so maybe check. And then this was quite cool. He's kind of boxing in this king, and then using the pieces that are there to exude some pressure. So the knight saved, and I don't think there's um, media checkmate ideas. It's good either way. The way he played it was fine. Rook e3, knight e2, check. And then with this very clear plan, the game was over. After king c1, final move of the game, rook takes d2, 
and resigns. What happens after rook takes d2? Check. Now the rook falls, pawns fall. Black's even a pawn up. This is just over. And yeah, that was Daniel Cordy's first game I've analyzed. And yeah, leave, leave your thoughts. I was really impressed. Um, the few moments I was impressed were initially with with knight a7, which seemed to to throw David out of book, and then bishop d7 and queen a6. Even though it was a blunder, I I quite appreciated it. Obviously, coming back to this rook a3 maneuver followed by knight e3 was all a bit out of my out of my pay grade. Not seeing these things yet, but to come back to why why queen a6 was a blunder, it's because of the move a4. And a4 seems to just solve quite a lot of issues using this piece that black decided not to capture. And then maybe maybe um, white was just afraid of bishop takes b2, but you've got tactics yourself after bishop b5. I don't think this was too tricky to find, because after bishop takes c1, you seem to be doing okay. And I was even wondering about possibilities to trap this knight now. I don't know, white, white maybe underestimated the move a4, because bishop d, bishop, um, Bishop d4 was the biggest blunder of the game. Okay, thank you.